What's going on people, today we're about to break down episode 22 of Attack on Titan season 4 in which the rumbling continues and Annie finally escapes her crystal after years of being forced to listen to Armin. In this video I'll be explaining all the small details you need to know including the reason why Eren didn't stop the titans from rampaging and why Flock is about to go to war with the volunteers. Before we get into it though I just want to say that we are so close to reaching 400k subs so if you've been enjoying these breakdowns then I'd really appreciate if you smash that sub button if you haven't already. Okay, so in the last episode, Ymir disobeyed Zeke's order to sterilize the Eldian race, and instead he chose to help Eren in his plan to destroy all life outside the island. Within minutes of gaining the Founder's power, Eren then sent a telepathic message to every Eldian, and this new episode begins with Annie's dad's reaction to that message. As someone living in the Liberio internment zone, he quickly realizes that he's about to be trampled by the rumbling, alongside everyone else on the Marlian continent. One piece of trivia that I thought was worth mentioning is that as far as we know, Eren's grandparents are still alive in Liberio, so by flattening Marley, he's also knowingly murdering his own grandparents as well. Now, moving back to the island, Gabby and Reiner were on the search to find Falco. The last time we saw this character, he had just eaten Porco, and his pure titan was lying there in the street for anyone to grab. As the new holder of the Jaw Titan, his human body would have emerged at some point after this screenshot, and when that happened, Jean swooped in to take him away. Reiner correctly assumed that this is what happened, since there was no way that the scouts would have just ignored one of the nine titans. He then falls to his knees as his body took serious damage when the walls fell down, and this is because Eren weakened his armor titan by removing all the hardening. To be more specific, when Eren began the rumbling, he used his power to undo all titan hardening in the world, including the armor titan's armor, Annie's crystal, and obviously the walls themselves. Because of that, it meant the debris from the wall directly hit Reiner's unarmored titan, which is why he's so injured in the first place. After they find a place to rest, he makes it pretty clear that he doesn't believe Eren can be beaten, since the founder has ultimate control over all other titans and all subjects of Ymir. Despite this, Gabby still has the determination to at least try to stop the rumbling, and this scene of her tying up her hair is a direct parallel to when Eren did the same thing. In these moments, both of them were looking in the mirror mentally preparing themselves for the fight ahead, and if you give me a second, I'm going to quickly explain some of the other parallels between them. To start with, it was confirmed several years ago that Gabby's design is based off this sketch of female Eren, which helps to explain the visual similarity between the two. In terms of personality, we've seen many times that they each have an insane level of willpower, and similar to how Eren once believed that freedom would come when they wiped out the Titans, Gabby believed that Eldians in Mali would have a better life once the island devils were all wiped out. Since then, both of them have gone through drastic transformations, and now their core motivation is to protect the people they care about. This ties into the next scene, where Jean acknowledges that they're the ones who are going to benefit from Eren destroying humanity. Thanks to the rumbling, they'll all be able to live peacefully on the island without the danger of being destroyed by Marley, and Historia no longer has to become a titan shifter after she gives birth. On top of that, none of them will be victims of Zeke's euthanization plan, meaning that overall, Eren has done what he's done so that they can all live long lives. That being said, Jean was still clearly unsure about whether this could be justified, while Armin was pretty certain that a massacre on this scale was going way too far. A minute later, the pure titan Zeke created then started attacking nearby Eldian soldiers, since they'd finished eating the Marlian soldiers who were in the district. Now, in theory, these pure titans shouldn't be rampaging like this because, as Yelena and Armin pointed out, at least one of the Jaeger brothers should be able to control them. In Zeke's case, he's normally able to command the titans he creates, but at this time he's got bigger things to worry about as he was seemingly absorbed by the source of all living matter. In Eren's case, he should also be able to control the titans as he has control over the coordinate, but his inaction can be explained by something he said during the declaration of war. In his own words, he keeps moving forward until his enemies are destroyed, and in this new situation, his founding titan is literally marching forward to trample their enemies. As a result, he's ignoring all the chaos that might be happening behind him, as his singular focus right now is to continue marching until the job's done. That's why he's not interfered with anything that's happened on Paradis since the rumbling started, with the consequence being that these titans are just allowed to go crazy and attack anyone who's nearby. Before the scouts deal with that though, there was a brief argument surrounding what they should do with Falco. Feeding Falco to someone would turn that person back into a human, and John points out that they can use this method to bring back Commander Pixis. Understandably, Connie's choice was to bring back his mother instead, but Armin wasn't so keen on feeding Falco to anyone. From his point of view, killing the warrior would only continue their conflict with the other warriors, which is something they don't have to do in a world where Marley no longer exists. However, that reasoning alone isn't strong enough for Connie to just abandon his mother as a pure titan, especially as it's coming from the guy who was brought back to life himself after eating one of the warriors. 
During this heated debate, one of the Titans smashed its face into the rooftop, giving Connie an opening to quickly kidnap Falco. As he flies off in the other direction, the scouts don't really have time to go after him, since they have to kill these Titans now before their rampage moves on to more populated areas of the island. This is a genuine possibility now that Eren has destroyed all three walls on Paradise, which has left the nearby districts wide open if the Titans were going to attack. For that reason, the scouts stick around to deal with this mess instead of chasing after Connie. And a quick side note is that in the manga, this Titan here looks a lot more like Saul Goodman from Breaking Bad. Anyway, as the carnage continues, we got a few different shots of people inside this fort being targeted, including the anti marlin volunteers and a handful of cadets. These are the same cadets who earlier in the season were certain that there'd never be any more Titan attacks, which is a statement that's now come back to bite them in a big way. Meanwhile, on the ground, Sasha's family were being chased by Niles Pure Titan, and after this accident, Kaya ended up getting cornered. This isn't the first time she's been trapped in this kind of scenario, only the last time it happened, Sasha showed up to save her life. That's why she calls out for Sasha just before Nile lunges towards her, and if he had eaten her here, then this hands down would have been one of the most tragic deaths in the series. It's not that Kaya is an important character, but her being eaten in front of her family while calling out for her dead sister, I mean, that would have been hard to watch. Luckily for her though, Gabby arrives at just the right moment with her anti-Titan gun, and it was mentioned a few episodes ago that this thing can kill pure Titans with a direct hit to the nape. On her second attempt, she does manage to deal that finishing blow, putting an end to Evan's longtime friend, and for a brief moment, Kaya literally sees Sasha standing in front of her. Besides the fact that Gabby and Sasha have similar hair, the reason Kaya sees this is because Sasha's the one she depends on in times of crisis, and in this scene she hadn't yet processed that Gabby stepped into that role. After this, a couple of nearby Eldian soldiers arrive, and they start to suspect that Gabby might not be from the island. In order to save her from being taken away or potentially killed, everyone pretended like they were a family, while Niccolo used his Marlian heritage as a valid excuse for why they have this type of gun. As they're taken to safety, Kaya then wonders why Gabby saved her from Nile, given that in the recent past, she was ranting about how Eldians on the island were devils. Since then, her perspective has changed a lot as I mentioned earlier, hence why she replies by saying that the real devil was her, and it's what led her to kill so many people. What I thought was interesting is that Niccolo chimed in saying that they all have a devil inside them, and in his case this was shown when he was fully prepared to kill Gabby after realizing what she did to Sasha. He finishes by saying that to overcome the devils inside them, they need to at least keep trying to leave the forest. This is a direct reference to when Mr. Brow said the world is a giant forest where everyone's fighting for their lives, and that the young people need to leave this forest to end the cycle of killing. Back at the fort, one of the main cadets was about to be eaten by a pure titan, and if this time looks familiar, it's because he was the drunk MP from episode 10, who argued that they should turn Astoria into a titan even though she was pregnant. Instructor Shardis then swoops in just in time to save the cadets, having seemingly forgiven them for beating him up not that long ago. The instructor's plan here was to use himself and the recruits as bait, and lure the titans to the fort where the scouts could finish them off. Moments like this definitely make you appreciate just how much the main cast has evolved, since they're now the veterans that everyone's relying on in times like this. When it comes to Mikasa, I guess you could say she was always one of the elite soldiers from the very beginning, but for everyone else, it's interesting just how quickly they all had to grow up. This shot of them diving off the roof was easily one of the best in the entire episode, and as they deal with the swarm of titans, Armin is the one who steps up to deliver the finishing blow on Pixis. All of his leadership and achievements are why he was the first person John thought of when evaluating who to feed Falco to, but with the warrior candidate missing, there wasn't really any option but to kill Pixis there and then. The anime then shows us a brief shot of Mikasa's biggest fan watching her in battle, but while Louise is distracted, she gets caught up in this explosion, and this will have serious consequences for the character. Sometime afterwards inside the fort, Onyankopon realizes that his homeland is going to be trampled by the rumbling, which is especially tragic considering that his knowledge and skills were a huge factor in why Zeke and Eren were brought together. He helped the people of the island because he believed that this was the best way to get revenge on Marley, but instead it's now backfired in the worst way possible. Off to the side, Yelena seems to have lost the will to live even more than he has, since Zeke's euthanization plan looks like it's not going to happen. An injured flock then arrives to arrest the volunteers, and if you're wondering why he's in bad shape, it's because he was literally hanging onto the walls as they began to come down. As the default leader of the Aegaris, Flock always made it very clear that what he wanted was the rumbling, and the reason he wanted it was so that Eldians could guarantee their right to live. There's no way someone like him would have ever supported the euthanization plan, and because Yelena did support it, she's now under arrest. He orders her to round up the other volunteers as well, and this is so that he can determine which of them have to die and which of them are willing to serve in the new Eldian Empire. 
The final scene of the episode is Mr. Bras leading Armin and Mikasa to meet Gabi, where she desperately pleads to get Falco back. An interesting point she raises is whether Eren could turn Connie's mother back into a human without the need for her to eat a Titan Shifter. In theory, this should be within Eren's powers given that he has full control over the DNA of every Eldian, but with him marching forward like I said, something like this isn't really a priority. Gabi then goes on to reveal that Reiner lost his hardening at the same time the walls came down, leading Armin to realise that all Titan hardening has come undone. Underground, we get a good look at Annie coughing and spluttering now that her crystal has been thawed out, and the name of this episode was a reference to this event. Ever since she was captured, her father maintained that she was alive and that she would come back, so it's no coincidence that the new content in this episode began with him, and now it ends with her. One final thing to say is that her clothes are dripping wet, almost like she's been freed from ice, which is different to how other hardening was shown to work. Therefore, we can speculate that the inside of this crystal might have a slightly different makeup to regular hardening, and whatever it's made of, it likely stops her from physically aging. After all, everything about her looks exactly the same as when she was captured, whereas the other Titan Shifters have visibly grown in that time. Let me know your thoughts on this down below and in general about the whole episode, and if this video helped your understanding in any way, then I'd appreciate if you hit that sub button and dropped a like. Thanks for watching as always, and until the next one, peace out.